Okay, so I'm Paul Graham. I'm a solutions architect with NVIDIA based in Edinburgh in the UK. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking about automatic mixed precision training in PyTorch. Okay, so why do we care about mixed precision training? Well, it can offer significant benefits, uh, especially on uh, the latest generation of GPUs, which have dedicated hardware for, for performing certain calculations at different precisions. Uh, so that hardware is in our Volta, Turing, and now our new Ampere GPUs. So this can really speed things up, but it can also mean that we use less memory. Uh, we can be just as powerful and just as accurate in terms of our model performance uh, with no change to our model network architecture. Um, the reduced memory requirements of mixed precision also enable you to build bigger, more powerful models if you choose to do so. So hopefully you'll come away from this talk uh, with uh, an introduction to mixed precision training and with a good idea of how you can introduce it into your um, training uh, paradigms. We're going to focus on PyTorch today um, because that's what the rest of the uh, webinars are focusing on. But there are similar efforts for automating mixed precision training in both TensorFlow and, uh, TensorFlow and MXNet. Uh, in particular, uh, today I'm going to be talking about a tool that NVIDIA has written uh, that has now been incorporated into native PyTorch. Uh, originally, we had an extension called Apex, which you use for doing automatic mixed precision. But because uh, this has become so important and so commonly used, it's now being incorporated into native PyTorch. So this automatic mixed precision, or, or AMP as we call it, enables you to take advantage of mixed precision training automatically just by adding a few lines of Python to an existing trainer script. So to, just to cover the agenda, uh, we'll introduce uh, what is mixed precision training. Uh, we'll look at some of the important theory and concepts behind it and the potential benefits. Then we'll look at the principles to bear in mind when making use of AMP. Uh, and finally, I'll go through the tools we've written to streamline the implementation of mixed precision in your own models. So first of all, we'll do an introduction to mixed precision training. So what do we mean when we talk about different positions? Well, this is basically how the GPU and how computers generally represent uh, floating point numbers in, in memory. Um, so you can imagine the ruler analogy. Uh, if we think of a ruler, the length of the ruler uh, is our range. It shows the, how large a number we can represent in our different positions. The number of tick marks on our ruler shows the precision. Uh, so the mantissa part, this shows you how, uh, so the more tick marks you have, the finer precision you can have. So for FP32, single precision, we see here that we have an 8-bit exponent. So this gives us our range. We can uh, see a, a large range of numbers going down to very small numbers. And a 23-bit mantissa, so this gives us lots of tick marks uh, on our ruler. For FP16, we have... Uh, uh, a much smaller exponent and a much smaller mantissa. So that means the range that of numbers that we can represent is much smaller. It only goes up to 65,504 there. Uh, and also the uh, steps between those numbers are, are fewer as well. So there's fewer tick marks on our ruler. Um, but why do we use these different data types in different places? So we can make use of these different positions for different operations. Uh, some operations can be handled at the lower position, so half position, FB16, and some, but some require the, the single position, FB32. If you're doing inferencing, you can actually even go lower. You can go down to int8, for example. Uh, but for training, you want to go focus on floating points. And by taking advantage of these different positions, we can take full advantage of our hardware. We can pair the, the certain operations with a certain position, uh, and this could take advantage of the dedicated hardware and the GPU for performing these particular operations. It allows us to run our models quickly and still achieve high accuracy. In addition, uh, we have a new uh, uh, data type represented in our Ampere architecture GPUs called TensorFlow32, which has the uh, di dynamic range of FP32 with precision FP16. So this is also almost hardware support for uh, mixed precision. But I won't go into too much detail on that today. So we want to maximize our model performance. So FP16, half position, is fast and memory efficient. So if we think of um, single position, FP32, uh, we set that as our bar as one times compute throughput, one times memory throughput, one times memory storage. How does FP16 compare? Um, well, it's about half the size, so we need half the storage. Um, so half the model size required for memory, or twice as many layers, or twice as big a batch size, 
or we can increase the predictive power with the same architecture and the same footprint, which gives us more room for experimentation. Smaller size means that bandwidth bound operations, where the speed is determined by the rate at which they can pull data from global memory to the cores, uh, and we can achieve two times uh, speed up by taking advantage of that. Um, if we take advantage of the tensor cores, we can actually improve our compute throughput by up to eight times. Um, and that's the main point that we'd want to use FP16. Uh, we have these tensor cores, which I'll speak about in the next slide. So this diagram represents the Volta and Turing tensor cores. Um, ampere tensor cores are more flexible in the sense they can take different size matrices. So tensor cores are hardware enabled uh, matrix multiplication and accumulation operations uh, or, and convolutions on FP16 inputs, which we can get up to 125 teraflops throughput, which is effectively eight times faster than FP32 on the Volta B100. Uh, I mentioned there at the bottom there, the A100 actually goes up to 16 times faster. The tensor core hardware internally carries out accumulate in FP32, so it takes in FP32 or FP16 input, uh, internally performs FP32 accumulate, and out at the end it gives you the FP16 or FP32 output. So the mass is fast, it's bandwidth efficient, it's high throughput, but also numerically stable. So this raises the question, why do we not run the whole model in FP16? So FP32 has its own share of benefits. It has wider dynamic range. We saw it could represent a larger range of numbers. And because of its increased precision, it can capture small accumulations. And these can be very beneficial for certain operations in the network. So if we look at this example here, here's a sum over an array of 4,096 elements, each with a value of 16. So if we'd want to do that sum in um, in uh, half position, we actually will get an overflow here. The uh, half position can't represent the sum, so we get a, a, an error. In FP32, it's absolutely fine because it's well within the range that we can represent it. So this is an example where FP32 would be preferred due to its better range. FP32 helps if your function is numerically sensitive to its inputs, and also if your function produces outputs outside the dynamic range of FP16, and if you're accumulating, which of course may involve addition of small values plus large values. So for an example of where you see such a calculation is for your weight updates. For example, late in training when your gradients are small, especially when you're multiplying them by the learning rate, the magnitude can get very small. So you're adding a parameter value plus a relatively small gradient update. So here you'd probably need a, a wide, wide uh, representation of precision. You need a lot of precision to actually capture that update so that the network trains correctly. So for example, in this one, if my parameter value is one and my gradient value is 0 0.0001, if I try and try this in FP16, it just gives a value of one again. Uh, it doesn't take into account the gradient. It doesn't have enough precision to capture that update. The, the technical limit for this uh, uh, to happen is when the ratio of the update to the parameter is smaller than 2 to times 10 to the minus 11, which is a proxy 0 0.005 for FP16, which is a small value, but not unreasonably small. You can certainly imagine uh, uh, weights and gradients uh, having some effect at that scale. So that needs to be taken into account. Obviously, in FP32, there's a sim and indeed all positions, there is a similar effect, but the ratio where that takes effect is much greater than for FP16. So in, in this case, of course, FP32 can capture this update uh, very, very straightforwardly. So that's uh, another situation where we want to use FP32 instead of FP16. So to summarize, it's beneficial to match up operations that are FP16 friendly with FP16 precision and FP32 friendly with FP32 precision. Uh, for example, if you want to ensure that your matrix multiplications and your convolution, convolution operations in FP16, so you can take advantage of the tensor cores designed specifically for that task. And you also like to be sure that your weight updates are being carried out in single position so that you get the benefits of FP32. So here's a, a little example graph uh, with examples that are two operations that are fine in half precision, FP16, uh, and then you switch to single position for the operations that benefit FP32. So the point that we want to make here though is that automatic mixed position or AMP can do all of this for you. You don't have to worry about this. AMP can go through your network 
and make sure that your operations are paired with the appropriate position. And ensure that your training is efficiently as possible and taking full advantage of your GPU hardware. So why do we care about this? Because it makes things go faster. So here's a few examples of on a Volta uh, V100 card of using mixed precision versus uh, single precision in your training. So for BERT, we're seeing between a three and four times speed up. For Jasper, a two, two to three times speed up uh, and various other speed ups there. So these are all significant. And if you think about the new A100 architecture, you can pretty much double, uh, double these uh, values in, uh, and even more in many cases. But what is the impact on accuracy of our network? We're doing things at a lower position, so perhaps this will have an effect. Well, we've looked at many, many different networks uh, and applied mixed position, and we found uh, that all of them have converged to an accuracy comparable to that of the default pure uh, single position. As long as you implement mixed position properly, you use it for the appropriate operations, the converged accuracy tends to be comparable with default single position end to end. Uh, it's important to emphasize with mixed precision, you do not need to change your hyperparameters or your learning rate schedule. So you don't need to do any retuning in that sense. You can just enable mixed precision, your model will run faster and converge to the same accuracy. So how can you re realize these benefits in your own network? So we're gonna dive a bit more deeply into what, what's happening under the bonnet and the mixed precision principles used in this operation. So, there are two main principles. We want to accumulate an FP32, and then we also want to represent the values uh, throughout our training in the appropriate dynamic range. So we've established there's no cost in terms of accuracy convergence, uh, but there's also lots of potential benefit. For retraining, for example, once a baseline is established, you may discover that mixed precision receives the same accuracy in half the time or less. So we just need to make sure that we make we use the correct position for the correct calculations. So at this point, you might be asking yourself, why don't I do everything FB16? Well, as we showed you earlier, uh, sometimes you can do everything in FB16, but there are certain operations that benefit from FB32. And leaving them in FB32 can improve accuracy and stability in end-to-end -end training. One of these is the weight updates. We've already seen this example earlier. So the issue I mentioned earlier, the weight updates are an accumulation. So reiterating that slide, if we update our value of one in float 16 with 0 0.001, we just get one, but in FP32, we get the right answer. As the weight updates are an accumulation, AMP maintains those weights in FP32. There's another challenge with a thing called gradient underflow. The gradients can become very small, especially late in training for earlier layers in the model and those small values can underflow the FP16 dynamic range, effectively becoming zero, and your model will stop training. As we can see in this stylized depiction, you start from your loss, creating some gradients, and as they flow back through your model, they get smaller and smaller until eventually they underflow to zero. So the way AMP handles this is with something called loss scaling. You multiply the loss by some scale factor, and by the chain rule, this also scales all the gradients as they flow backwards to the network. And in this schematic de depiction, you can see that this has ensured that all the gradients as they flow, flow through the network remain within the FP16 representable range. And then finally, when we get to the last layer, whether the last layer happens to be FP32, FP16, we end up with some scale gradients and we copy those to back to single position bef before we unscale them. After we divide by this loss scale to return the gradients to what they would have been, in other words, such that it's orthogonal to the learning rate, it doesn't affect the learning rate at all. Um, so we can use loss scaling uh, without having any impact on the learning rate because we unscale the gradients. Because we unscale them in single position, we may end up with values that weren't representable in FP16, but that's fine because we want to do the weight update in FP32 anyway. So we just unscale into FP32, we do the weight update in FP32, and we have that full position and range working for us. So in a little more detail in the code, what appears is you just multiply the loss by some scale factor to create some scaled loss. So here we see the line scaled loss equals loss times S. Then you call scaled loss backwards on the scaled loss, which again by the chain rule also scales all the gradients. 
which allows us to preserve small gradient values as it boosts them into the FP16 representable range. And then finally, we unscale the gradients in full FP32 position before calling optimize a step. And again, this unscaling ensures the gradient values are what they would have been if you hadn't used any scaling. So fair thought, loss scaling doesn't affect any of your high parameters and it doesn't change your effective learning rate. AMP takes care of both of those things for you automatically. So let's see how you can enable AMP programmatically in PyTorch. I mentioned earlier that we used to use an, ex an extension called Apex when performing automatic mixed precision in PyTorch. But now that this approach has become so prevalent in the training process, it has been incorporated fully into native PyTorch as, a, as AMP. As a module, it is more flexible and intuitive to use and has various sort of advantages, which makes this a really positive move. We're going to see over the next few slides how to take an existing single position training script, add a few lines of code to invoke AMP, and then gain the benefits of accelerated training. So let's look at the different steps we need to uh, incorporate AMP into your, your training. So first of all, we need to import the modules. We've got uh, torch.cuda.amp.autocast and torch.cuda.amp.gradscaler. So just two modules we need to import. Order casting automatically chooses the posi position for GPU operations to improve performance whilst maintaining accuracy. The gradient scaling improves the convergence for networks with uh, FP16 gradients by min minimizing the gradient underflow as we showed uh, in the example earlier. For step two, we're going to make use of auto casting. This automatically chooses the appropriate position for operations on the GPU to improve performance while still maintaining accuracy. For step three, we introduce the gradient scaling. As explained earlier, gradient scaling improves convergence for networks using half precision gradients by minimizing any gradient underflow. First, we scale the loss to create the scaled gradients to be used in the backward propagation. Then we invoke scalar.step. This first unscales the gradients and checks for any which contain an infinite or not a number value. If they're OK, great. It proceeds to call step on the optimizer. If they do contain an infinite or not a number, the optimizer step is skipped and the scale factor is reduced in order to try again. Note that the, re the reverse is also true. If there is a run of successful steps with no infinite or not a number values, then the scale factor is increased. Just to recap, here are all the steps required in one script. We set up the gradient scaler, we apply order casting to the forward pass, and then apply the gradient scaling to the back propagation. Just a few lines of code added to your training script, and this allows you to significantly accelerate your training by taking full advantage of the underlying GPU hardware. If you were doing multi GPU training with Horovod, this is compatible with AMP, and here's a simple example showing how you might do that. Note as social here that we have added an argument args.useAMP to the grad scaler and order cast calls. This allows us to easily enable or disable AMP by setting this flag to true or false. Hopefully you've seen that utilizing AMP is very straightforward. We focused on PyTorch in this talk, but there are similar approaches being used in other frameworks such as MXNet and TensorFlow. And if you're using GPUs for your training, I'd strongly recommend taking advantage of this. You'll see significant speed ups, thus reducing your overall training time, but also give yourself some flexibility, for example, to try larger models as you are using a smaller precision. Apex AMP still exists to support backwards compatibility, but going forward, we'd recommend using the fully integrated AMP module in PyTorch. I've provided some links here. So there is the AMP package and some further examples of its usage and an interesting blog post, which includes some more performance figures, including some on the new A100 GPU. AMP's available in our latest NGC container for PyTorch and also in the 1.6.0 release for PyTorch. And finally, I'd just like to acknowledge my colleague, Michael Carilli, who developed AMP in PyTorch and provided much of the material for these slides. So my thanks to him. Okay, any questions?